to try and hide. Order, Senator Lambie. You will be in continuation when debate resumes. Being 2 p.m. Um, Senator, we move to questions without notice. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a statement relating to shadow ministerial arrangements. Leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise that the opposition has made two changes affecting shadow assistant ministers. Ms Merrill Swanson, MP, has been appointed as shadow assistant minister for defence, replace, replacing the hon. Dr Mike Kelly, AMMP. Senator Jenna McAllister has been appointed as shadow assistant minister for communities in the prevention of family violence, a new position in addition to her existing responsibilities in the portfolio of families and social services. The hon. Linda Burney, MP. I congratulate both Ms Swanson and Senator McAllister and seek leave to table the revised shadow ministry list and to have it incorporated into Sir Hansard. Leave is granted. Senator will move to questions. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Minister, on Friday you could not tell the Senate Select Committee how many aged care residents had passed away from COVID-19. Can the minister tell us today how many residents of aged care facilities funded and regulated by the Morrison government has passed away since he failed to provide that answer? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Gallagher, for the question. And can I, at the outset, express my sincere condolences to every resident's family who have lost a loved one during the pandemic into aged care? Can I also say that I should have had the data on Friday, and I apologise for not having done that? To my colleagues, who I have successfully uh, taken the attention of what it should be, which is our efforts to combat the virus, but also to the Senate. I should have had the information and uh, my, my fault, my responsibility, and I take full responsibility for not having that information available to me at the time. Mr. President, sadly, uh, nationally, since the commencement of the pandemic, there's 335 Australians who have passed away in residential and, um, and in home care. Um, Mr. President, uh, 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 there have been uh, seven home care recipients and 328 residential care uh, recipients who have passed away. Uh, it's an absolute tragedy. Every single one of those deaths is an absolute tragedy. Uh, and that's why this government's worked so hard since the beginning of the pandemic to put in place measures to firstly protect Australia through the National Health Pandemic Plan, uh, and then the other measures that we've put in place, which now total in excess of $1 billion to support the residential aged care sector to manage the virus uh, and to protect Australians, uh, particularly those in residential aged care, because we know that they, in the sense of if they contract the virus, are the most vulnerable. So right from the outset, right, right from January, when we first started talking to the sector with respect to what they ought to be doing in preparation, uh, then with the National Health Pandemic Plan that Order. we Senator put together Colbeck. in— Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, can the minister tell us today how many residents of aged care facilities funded and regulated by the Morrison government have now contracted COVID-19? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so far, across Australia, there have been 1,761 residents of residential aged care facilities, residential aged care facilities, uh, who have uh, contracted the virus. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Maria Vasilakis, who just celebrated her 81st birthday, died alone after contracting COVID-19 at St Basil's. Maria Rukavina, who tested positive after being hospitalised with long-standing skin infections, died alone in the Epworth Hospital. Her son Ivan had gone five days without getting an update on her condition. What does the minister have to say to the 335 families grieving the loss of a loved one? about his failure to remember the number of older Australians in aged care who have died from COVID-19. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as I said in my first answer, I offer my condolences, my sincerest condolences, and that of the government to every single one of those families who lost a loved one. It's a tragedy. Every single life that has been lost is an absolute tragedy. It's the tragedy of this wicked, wicked virus. Uh, and I offer my apology to them for not knowing the number, as I did in my primary answer. 
I should have had the information. I didn't, and I take full responsibility for that. I should have had that data. I apologise to those people who, who uh, I wasn't able to give that answer to. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on how the Liberal and the Nationals government is supporting Victoria through its coronavirus second wave outbreak and driving health recovery in Victoria? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McKenzie for the question. Mr President, as we've seen over recent months, uh, supporting Victoria to suppress community transmission of COVID-19 is critical not just to economic recovery, of course, but also to save lives. Sadly, as a result of the second wave of COVID-19, we have now seen over 517 Australians lose their lives. Uh, the Morrison government has stepped up our support to the Victorian government to assist them in combating the effects of COVID-19. The Australian government's Department of Health is assisting the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services to undertake contact tracing. Over 1,700 Australian defence personnel are currently deployed to Victoria to assist with contact tracing, testing, Victoria Police checkpoints and logistics. The government has substantially increased dispatches of personal protective equipment PPE, from the national medical stockpile in July and August. Of the more than 66 million masks dispatched from the National Medical Stockpile to date, over 23 million masks have been dispatched to Victoria, including 9 million masks dispatched for Victorian aged care providers. The Australian government is dispatching 186,000 goggles from the National Medical Stockpile to assist Victorian general practitioners and allied health providers. Additionally, the Australian government has established 28 GP-led respiratory clinics in Victoria, providing free holistic care and testing for patients with respiratory illness. Respiratory clinics in Victoria have assessed more than 153,200 people and conducted now over 138,000 tests. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. As the second stage of lockdowns has placed additional strain on the mental health of Victorians, what support is the government providing to bolster mental health services? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. The Australian government is making a significant investment to support the mental health of all Australians, but indeed the mental health of Victorians. We are investing $26.9 million to create 15 mental health clinics across Victoria, nine in Melbourne, and six Senator McKenzie in regional Victoria. We're investing $5 million to enhance digital and phone services for groups that are experiencing significant challenges during the restrictions that are now in place. $14.6 million to support mental health providers respond to increased demand in Victoria, including $5 million to support Headspace, $2 million to support the Kids Helpline, $2.5 million to support Lifeline and $2.5 million to support Beyond Blue. The impacts of the COVID-19 outbreak, physical distancing and isolation can make us feel anxious, stressed and worried. And our message to Australians is, if you are suffering, Order. we Senator can help Cash. you with the help Time you need. The has expired. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please update the Senate on the state of the Australian response to COVID-19 and why it's still important for all Australians to remain vigilant and take precautions to stop the spread of COVID-19. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And our testing in Australia has now seen 5.7 million tests conducted across Australia. Of those, over 24,821 Australians have been diagnosed with COVID-19. And as I stated, in my first answer, sadly, 517 Australians have lost their lives. Our tracing effort, though, has been critical in our response, and the COVID Safe app has now seen over 7 million downloads and is enabling us to trace, obviously, those cases. Uh, we are now at a very important moment nationally. In June and July, we saw positive signs of economic recovery in the states that have suppressed the virus. 
It is critical that we support Victoria to contain community transmission so that we can protect the lives of Australians and their livelihoods. The Victorian second wave has made it clear how we must all Order, follow Senator and observe Cash, time social the distancing has practices. Expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. How many aged care residential facilities are currently experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank Senator Keneally for the question. Currently, there are 126 facilities in Victoria that have a COVID-19 outbreak. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Is that the national figure? Thank you, Mr. President. I note that wasn't the full answer to my question. I did ask for the national figure. Perhaps the minister could update that as he also answers how many aged care residential facilities have now recorded more than 100 cases. Senator Colbeck. Senator, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, uh, on the figures that I have, the only facilities with a current outbreak are in Victoria. So that is the national figure of facilities with a national outbreak. Um, and I don't have an individual breakdown of all facilities with me at question time here now. I'm very happy to bring back to you an answer to that question, but I don't believe there is any facility that has more than uh, 100 residents that are positive, uh, but I'll confirm that at the end of the question time for you. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate when the first outbreak at Epping Gardens Aged Care was first reported and how many COVID-19 cases have been re reported at that facility since? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said, I don't have a detailed breakdown of every facility, the first date of um, the outbreak or the number of residents and staff who have tested positive. I'm happy to provide that information to the Senate at the end of question order, time. Point of order. On a point of order, Senator Keneally. Thank you. I appreciate the minister is attempting to answer the question. Could he, if he's going to take it on notice, could he confirm that the answer is 210 Senator cases? Keneally, Senator Keneally, at please, that's, that, that's not a point of order at all. Sorry, Senator Cormann. That, that was just uh, my point. This was uh, absolutely not a point of order. This was a political point. If Senator Keneally has the answer at her fingertips because she, of course, knows the question that she was going to ask. Why did she ask it if, uh, for, for, if, if not for anything other than just playing politics with what is a very serious issue? Order. You Senate. should be ashamed of yourself. Order. I will call Senator Wong when there's silence. Order. Sen Senator McGrath. Senator Wong. Uh, this is a very serious issue. This involves the deaths of too many Australians. Uh, and it is entirely appropriate that the opposition ask this minister questions which go to his handling of this crisis. That is what the opposition is doing, and that is what the opposition will continue to do. Okay. Um, firstly, on the point of order, Senator Keneally, you know better that wasn't a point of order. I remind senators that when they rise on a point of order, they have to point to the standing order they believe is being breached. Um, it's not up to me or the chair to go to the motives of anyone seeking a, a, an answer to a question in question time. Um, I've allowed the two leaders to make observations on that point, and I urge senators to re remember the standing orders when they're asking, answering questions, and raising points of order. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, and as I said, um, there are 126 facilities in Victoria with an active case right now. I don't have a full list of all those 126 cases with me. But I have committed to getting back to Senator Keneally and the Chamber at the end of question time with the details that she's asked for. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister update the Senate on what practical support Defence has been providing to states and territories to minimise the spread of COVID-19 and drive our health recovery? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patterson for the question and for his tremendous support for our troops in uh, Victoria at this time. I am so proud of the efforts of the Defence Department and also our ADF 
uh, and they're also their family support during the COVID-19 pandemic. The ADF very quickly adapted and developed new business as usual uh, processes and practices during COVID-19. We did that to ensure defence keeps our people in Australia and also over 2,000 personnel deployed overseas to keep them safe. Safe when on training exercises, when actually on uh, exercises on operational deployments and also on routine uh, postings. We did that to make sure that we adapted very early and then we now maintain the best possible health uh, protocols. Since February, under Operation COVID-19 Assist, Defence has been providing a wide range of support to all states and territories with their COVID-19 response. And Defence has demonstrated great capability and great agility uh, in that support. Providing support uh, has been in many forms, in traditional tasks such as planning, logistics and also in health support, but a number of new tasks such as contact tracing and also training to drive ambulances. Today, over 3,400 ADF members are supporting all states and territories uh, with their COVID responses. And throughout the pandemic, Defence has been posted to respond to requests for support again from all states and territories. Following the Prime Minister's offer to First Ministers, to all First Ministers on the 27th of March, uh, for, with assistance with the ADF for mandatory hotel quarantine, the ADF prepared 100 personnel in each large state and 50 in smaller states. The following day in New South Wales, ADF personnel began supporting the reception of international arrivals. And can I say to all colleagues here, we have much to be proud of in how our ADF has responded Order. to Senator Operation Reynolds, Bushfire Assist the and COVID has Assist. Expired. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I do. Uh, can the minister provide further detail on the support provided to authorities in my home state of Victoria? Senator Reynolds. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. And yes, I can. Uh, our ADF personnel have been assisting Victorian authorities since the 23rd of March this year with its COVID-19 response. Uh, since then, we have supported 11 separate Victorian requests for assistance. Today, 1,700 defence personnel are deployed to Victoria to support its uh, latest efforts to get this next wave under control. Three, for example, 330 ADF personnel are supporting contact tracing uh, through data management, admin and logistics support and also door knocking close contacts unable to be contacted by phone. 250 ADF personnel are, supported, are supporting COVID-19 testing right across the state of Victoria. Uh, 150 ADF personnel are supporting seven Victoria Police vehicle control points and, as I said, ADF are providing support in new ways, including doing training with Ambulance Victoria and also now doing training and assistance to the Victorian Aged Care uh, Response Centre. Again, Order. I Senator thank them all Reynolds. for their service. Time for the answer expired. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister also provide further detail on the support provided to Western Australian authorities? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And yes, I can. Uh, the ADF has been providing critically important support to the West Australian government authorities since the 22nd of March this year. Since then, we have supported 10 separate WA requests for assistance. And today, 112 ADF personnel are on the ground in Western Australia. But at its peak on the 22nd of April, the ADF had 326 personnel assisting uh, West Australian authorities with their COVID-19 response. Uh, this builds on the support the ADF had provided uh, earlier in March with the, to assist with the cruise ship disembarkation. And that assistance provided included uh, assistance with quarantine compliance checks and also a range of logistic support, including cargo transportation. And on the 3rd of August this year, we did agree to provide 50 ADF personnel to support WA authorities with hotel quarantine at five hotels, and we're now working with them on a new request. Order. Senator Reynolds. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to Senator Colbeck, the Minister for Aged Care and, Seniors, and Senior Australians. Minister, uh, through you, uh, Mr. President, um, on Friday, the government announced $171 million additional funding for aged care, while experts acknowledge that an initial, an additional investment of $3.5 billion is what's actually needed to improve hours of care and workforce conditions and address other aged care issues. Minister, 
Are you going to invest the $3.5 billion that's recommended to be needed to fix the aged care sector? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The, uh, and thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. The $171 million that we announced on Friday was a further contribution towards our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's what it was specifically targeted to do. It wasn't designed to fix the aged care sector. Different situation. Mr President, uh, uh, we are currently uh, in the middle of a royal commission into the aged care sector, which was given the task of forensically looking Order. at the entire aged care sector and then coming back to government with recommendations on what we should do uh, to improve the residential aged care sector in this country, in fact, including the home care sector. Uh, we are watching that process very closely. Uh, our officials engage with the Commission on a regular basis. They continue to issue papers, including one that they issued this morning with respect to quality indicators. Uh, and we will respond, as I have said and as the Prime Minister has said, to the Royal Commission uh, when it makes its recommendations. So I acknowledge the Prime Minister has acknowledged uh, that's why we called the Royal Commission that there are issues with residential and the aged care sector more broadly in this country. Clearly there are. That's why we called the Royal Commission. Uh, we look forward to its report when it reports on the 26th of February next year. Uh, and the objective that I have and I know that the Prime Minister has is for us to make a significant uh, response to that Royal Commission report uh, in our budget next year. So that's the timeline that we have. We acknowledge that there's additional funding that's requ required for this sector, uh, and we've, we have, we have uh, invested significantly in this sector since uh, in the last two budgets, in excess of, say, $3 billion for 50,000 home care Time places. for the answer has expired. Senator see what a supplementary question. Thank you. On Friday at the COVID committee hearing into aged care, you said that no country in the world has avoided COVID-19 outbreaks in aged care facilities. Does that mean that Australia doesn't have to try harder to prevent further outbreaks? Minister, don't you agree that Australia should be aiming to do better than the UK, Canada and the US where so many people have died in aged care. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Seward, for the supplementary question. Uh, what I said was that where there has been significant community transmission, there has been COVID-19 outbreaks in residential aged care everywhere in the world. Uh, and with respect to your comments about a number of other countries, we actually are doing better than all of those significantly better than all of those. In fact, our circumstance with respect to infections in residential aged care as a uh, number of residents and, uh, and or more deaths as a proportion of, of aged care places is 35 times better than the UK. It, it is 35 times Order. better than the UK. In fact, we're doing better than all of those Order. countries. Senator, we are I've one of the best Senator in the Colbeck, world I've got in respect Senator Colbeck. Please resume your seat. I've got Senator Cormann on a point of order. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. On a point of order, uh, interjections are always disorderly, but they're particularly disorderly when they're complaining about a minister answering the question that was asked in a way that is directly relevant to the question that in was asked. Interjections are always disorderly. I was calling the chamber to order, and I thank you for helping me remind the chamber, Senator Cormann. Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. President, and and. As I've said a number of times today, every single death in residential aged care is a tragedy. I again offer my condolences to every family who's lost a family member. That's why we have worked since Order. the outset Senator of Colbeck, this pandemic the to mitigate the opportunities for aged Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In August, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission undertook 74 spot checks in Victoria and 41 spot checks in New South Wales. Minister. Through you, President, will you guarantee that the government will undertake an, an audit of every aged care facility in this country to ensure that they are fully prepared and we don't see the same sort of outbreaks that we have just seen in Victoria? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, throughout this pandemic, the government has continued to work with 
closely with the residential aged care sector to provide them with information, with advice, with funding to assist them to mitigate the entry of uh, COVID-19 into residential aged care and to assist them to deal with it if it does. We've done that on a consistent basis and we will continue to do that. This morning we released the new March report, which I provided directly to every single aged care provider in the country. Uh, we've already implemented a lot of the learnings from New March in our response in Victoria. We continue to do that. And we continue to work with residential aged care providers across the country, including a decision out of National Cabinet last Friday, where we will be working through the Quality and Safety Commissioner with states to look to visit every provider in, commencing in, Victoria, in Tasmania and Queensland to ensure that their systems are up to speed. Uh, and if we find a, uh, an Order, opportunity Senator for improvement, Kopic, we'll time push for the for answer that. has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian Senator Colbeck. On the 12th of April, Minister Colbeck declared he had planned for, and I quote, worst case scenarios. Given 335 older Australians in aged care have now tragically died from COVID-19. Does the minister believe Australia is now beyond the worst case scenario? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, in the context of residential aged care nationally, uh, we, we are in a relatively good position, given that uh, nearly over 80 per cent of the facilities in this country haven't contracted a case of COVID-19. We've, we've been very fortunate. We have been very fortunate. Uh, well, Senator, uh, thank you for the interjection. Uh, but as I've said a number of times, every death of, from COVID-19 in an aged care facility, every death from COVID-19 is an absolute tragedy. Every death. And uh, I, I again offer my condolences to all of them. Uh, but th this government has, since January, worked extremely closely with the sector to provide it with the advice and the resources to assist it to manage the COVID-19 outbreak. Have we got it right all the time? No, we haven't. And I've acknowledged that. But we continue, as we learn about this virus, which didn't exist before November last year, as we learn more about the virus, we learn more about the way it spreads, and we learn more about the measures that we need to take, we continue to implement those. And we are still learning, Mr President. We are still learning. We are still talking to the AHPPC about what more what we might do. We are still discussing at national cabinet level what more we might do so that we can continue to provide quality care and protect senior Australians who are in residential aged care and home care from the scourge of this terrible virus, which, when it gets into that age cohort, has absolutely devastating results. And that's what we will continue to do. We will continue to invest, we will continue to learn uh, and we will continue to work closely with the sector as we have done right through the pandemic. Senator Wong, supplementary question. On 7 July, this minister declared that his aged care system had, and I quote, responded incredibly well, incredibly well. Given that 335 Australians have now tragically died from COVID-19 in aged care, does he still believe the Morrison government has, re has responded incredibly well? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I said that the aged care sector had responded uh, incredibly well, which is what was in the initial part of Senator Wong's question. Uh, and, and we've worked very closely and we've worked very hard, taking the advice of the medical professionals in the AHPPC to provide advice to the sector. Uh, and the subcommittees of the AHPP3, AP, AHPPC, the CDNA, who have provided guidance updated now on three occasions to the sector. Uh, I think the sector have done well. We have been fortunate in this country. We have been extremely f fortunate that the front line of our defences, which, which were closing our borders early, including to China, setting up our um, national COVID-19 health response, has been largely effective. We didn't expect that the systems in Victoria would fall down in the way that they did. But 
As, as that's occurred, Mr. President, as that's occurred, we've continued Order. to respond Senator and to build our response. Senator Colbert, time for the response. answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Today, the minister has dismissed concerns about his performance, saying that we're doing better than almost any other country. Dismissed concerns, saying that Australia is in a relatively good position. Isn't this just yet another example of the very arrogance and hubris in the Morrison government when it comes to aged care that the Royal Commission referred to? That the Royal Commission referred to arrogance and hubris. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and I completely reject the premise of the question from Senator Wong. She can try and verbal me, she can try and put words in my mouth, uh, but I don't have to accept it. We have continued, we have continued to work closely. Order, Senator Cormann, on a point of order. Uh, interjections are always You're disorderly. reading my mind. The leader of the opposition Senator should be aware of this, and it's, this is an issue that deserves to be treated uh, appropriately, and, and I, I would ask you to call Senator Wong to order. Interjections are always disorderly. I would add that regardless of the matters being discussed. Senator, Senator Cormann. Uh, Senator Wong is interjecting even on the president. That is even it's, more disorderly. It's not you, as you are speaking. We haven't been here for a while. It's not the best way to start a couple of weeks. I ask people to restrain their urge to interject uh, as it's always disorderly. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. So, in, so in rejecting the premise of Senator Wong's question, uh, I note and I commit this government to continue to working with the sector, continuing to learn about the virus, continuing to take the health advice from the health professionals within the AHPPC and its subcommittees in the CDNA to ensure and, and continuing to invest where it is needed to ensure that senior Australians in residential aged care continue to uh, be protected from the virus. And we work with, yeah. we work with state governments on the public health response to ensure that we, re we reduce as much as possible the community transmission that is the source of infections. Thank you. And today being a day for firsts, I will be calling our first question virtually. Um, and I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Can you hear me? It's all good, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham, representing the Minister for Energy. I commissioned the highly respected economist, Dr. Alan Moran, to review government economic and energy data and to calculate the true cost of climate policies and so-called renewable energy. He delivered his report to me last week, and a copy has been sent to every member of federal parliament, including Senator Birmingham and the Minister for Energy. Dr. Moran's work cannot be sensibly refuted since he uses the government's own data that used to be published in a consolidated form until the cost of intermittent solar and wind energy sources became so embarrassingly and devastatingly high. Is the minister aware that the true cost of climate policies on households through electricity prices is a staggering $1,300 per household per year? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Senator Ryan, and I, 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 um, Order. And, uh, and I thank uh, Senator Roberts for his uh, historic question, at least, in, uh, in that sense. Um, uh, Mr, uh, Mr President, um, in relation to, uh, to the report that uh, Senator Roberts references uh, by Dr Moran, I have not seen a copy of that report. It may well have been uh, sent to my office, and, uh, and uh, I and I'm sure the Minister for Energy uh, will find an opportunity to uh, review that work uh, at an appropriate time. Uh, in terms of the questions of energy prices, uh, Mr. President, uh, our government uh, is certainly determined to continue our work to reduce energy prices wherever we possibly can. Uh, since July last year, we put in place our price safety net to cap standing offer prices in the energy market. And for residential customers who were on the highest standing offers uh, before 1 July last year, uh, they could well be better off by up to $666 per annum in New South Wales, $590 in South Australia or $725 in, uh, in South East Queensland in Senator Roberts's home state. These reforms are making tangible differences to, uh, to household energy prices and are bringing them down. Our introduction uh, of a reference price uh, requiring retailers to advertise offers in a way that's transparent and easy to compare 
has, according to the ACCC, seen the cheapest market offer as of September last year, some $290 to $355 lower uh, in New South Wales, $262 lower in South East Queensland, $330 lower in South Australia. Indeed, average wholesale electricity prices as well in the national electricity market in the first quarter of this year were the lowest since the fourth quarter of 2016. Our reforms are making a difference in terms of energy price at the wholesale level and the retail level. Order, we will continue Senator to Birmingham. work to reduce um, them. Before I call Senator Roberts, can I ask senators to maintain silence just until we get the volume levels right so we can all hear Senator Roberts um, ask this supplementary question? Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. Is the minister aware that the true cost of so-called climate policies and renewable energy on household electricity bills is not the 6.5 per cent that government reports? It is a whopping and devastating 39 per cent. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. As I said in, uh, in my answer to the primary question, uh, I've not reviewed Dr Moran's uh, report and I'm not aware that, uh, that uh, Minister Taylor or his department have done so uh, either. Uh, our focus continues to be as a government to get uh, energy prices down whilst meeting our emissions reduction obligations, whilst also ensuring reliability in the energy markets. And, uh, we are recording achievements across all of those three spheres in terms of meeting our emissions reduction obligations and commitments that we make as a country, uh, improving and delivering more reliability uh, in the energy grid uh, despite some of the challenges there have been previously, uh, and as I was outlining before, getting prices down at a wholesale level, at a retail level, for households, for businesses. The ABS tells us we've seen reductions in the national average retail price over the last year. That benefits both households and businesses. And the AER has shown in a recent report that high standing offers have been eliminated. These are tangible differences Order. flowing through Senator in Birmingham. electricity bills for Australia. Time Australian. for the answer has expired. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. On average, your government incentivises $8 billion of incentives each year for malinvestment in parasitic green energy projects. That results in a net loss of jobs in the economy. Analysis of Spain's experience indicates that with every green subsidised job, 2.2 real jobs are lost. With over 1 million Australians losing their job and unemployment rising due to COVID-19, shouldn't the government be stimulating job creation, not job losses? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. And uh, look, I, uh, I assure Senator Roberts, as I do uh, every member of this chamber and indeed every Australian, that our government is working as hard as we can uh, to create jobs uh, to help Australia out of the economic disaster created uh, by this pandemic. Uh, our work in terms of supporting and sustaining jobs throughout the pandemic through programs like JobKeeper uh, has been recognised as world leading. Uh, our effort in terms of deploying other policies, such as the Home Builder program, to head off potential declines in the construction industry, uh, our effort to support the creative arts sector uh, by attracting uh, more production into Australia and, uh, and supporting job generation and creation there, our efforts in terms of skills investment uh, that Senator Cash is, uh, is leading to make sure that Australians who may not have work at present are able to retrain for the future is all about creating jobs and helping Australians to get back into the employment market Order, as Senator we recover. Birmingham. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Senator Payne. Uh, Senator Payne, through you, uh, Mr President, the explosion in Beirut was a shocking and distressing event that, it's right, that has rightly mobilised the international community. Can the minister detail Australia's support to the people of Lebanon in the wake of the shocking explosion on the 4th of August? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Mullen very much for, uh, for his question. Uh, many Australians have been deeply saddened by the catastrophic explosion uh, in Beirut, and our thoughts and sympathies go to all those affected by the tragedy, uh, both here and in Lebanon, and most particularly to the family and the loved ones of Australian toddler Isaac Ola, uh, who tragically died in the blast. Uh, soon after the explosion, Mr. President, uh, Australia was able to announce uh, uh, $5 million in humanitarian assistance, which is being provided through international organisations, uh, particularly the World Food Programme, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Movement and the United Nations Children's Fund. Uh, we have also delivered 
urgently needed humanitarian supplies pre-positioned at the UN Humanitarian Response Depot in Dubai and provided, to, in, and provided those to NGO partners leading the response in Beirut. Uh, on Friday, the 14th of August, a Dubai-based uh, ADF C-130 delivered mobile warehouses to help replace critical storage facilities destroyed in the blast, and also shelter kits and tools for the uh, up to 300,000 people left homeless. And then last Friday, the ADF completed a second delivery of addition, additional shelter materials, and I acknowledge uh, the support of those personnel to affect uh, those deliveries. Those supplies were chosen after consultation with the humanitarian organisations that are leading the response in Beirut and certainly targeted to fill the gaps and meet the most urgent needs. Uh, we will continue to work with other international donors on possible further support. And our support will be based, Mr President, on need, on our ability to provide assistance in a timely manner and also on what other countries are already doing uh, in the context of the, uh, of the international response in particular. Senator Molan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what support the government has provided to Australians affected by this tragedy? Senator Payne. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The Australian Embassy itself in Beirut was significantly damaged uh, in the blast. Uh, fortunately, some minor, unfortunately, only minor injuries were uh, experienced by staff, and uh, we appreciate the support provided to them to, to address those injuries. Uh, I don't, however, underestimate, Mr. President, the psychological challenge that is uh, accompanied by the experience that those staff had, have had, and I acknowledge uh, the ambassador and her team for the very professional work that they are doing. They have been working constantly to help Australians, and we deployed additional staff as well to Beirut to assist in the response. Uh, our staff are providing consular assistance working actively to identify opportunities for Australians in Beirut to depart, uh, particularly in terms of the current incoming passenger restrictions, which does make that harder. Uh, they're providing many essential services, including the provision of emergency passports, and also continuing to make inquiries of local authorities. There are many dual nationals uh, always in, uh, in Beirut, in Lebanon more broadly, and for any further support that may be required to people in Order, those circumstances. Senator, Payne. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Australia's Lebanese community has, has responded with great humanity to the incident. How has the government been engaging with the Lebanese community? Senator Payne. Mr President, there has certainly been an outpouring of support from Australia's Lebanese community. Uh, it's admirable. It reminded us of the close relationship between our two countries, particularly uh, through the almost a quarter of a million Australians of Lebanese heritage. Uh, since the uh, explosion, the government has convened a series of, uh, of special teleconference meetings with leaders of the Australian Lebanese community. Uh, Minister Tudge and I attended one of those meetings, Minister Hawke uh, another. They have been very important chances to both convey our condolences, Mr. President, and to listen to the community's priorities uh, as they are um, applied here in uh, Australia and also for family and extended uh, um, co contacts in Lebanon. For any Australians who uh, wish to help, we do encourage them to provide a cash donation to trusted organisations that are delivering this urgently needed humanitarian assistance. Uh, we're working with the Lebanese community on the best mechanisms to uh, achieve this uh, and certainly thank them for the, commi for the commitment that they Order. are bringing to the task. Senator Payne. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian Senator Colbeck. Minister, who is responsible for aged care? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The responsibility for uh, funding aged care, predominantly funding aged care, and and also the administrative oversight of the uh, of the aged care sector. The regulatory framework for the aged care sector rests with the Commonwealth Government. Senator Urquhart, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Last week, the Premier of Tasmania said aged care is, and I quote, very clearly a federal responsibility in terms of funding and regulation. Is Premier Gutwin, Gutwin right or wrong? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I think that Premier Gutwin's statement just agreed with the answer that I gave to the primary answer. Senator Urquhart, a final <coughs> supplementary question. Can the minister confirm the government's own document released in February 
made clear the Australian government is responsible for protecting aged care residents by establishing and maintaining infection control guidelines and enforcing health care safety and quality standards. Senator Colby. As I said, Mr. President, uh, thanks, Senator Urquhart, for the question. Uh, the Australian government's responsible for the primary funding of residential aged care and its regulation. Uh, that's 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 a clear statement, and I agree with that uh, in the context of the question. We are at the moment. Order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. I, I, I'm happy to sit down if the minister is going to get to the point. I had a point on direct relevance because Senator Urquhart put directly to the minister whether or not the Australian government was responsible for protecting residents through infection control guidelines, health healthcare safety and quality standards. But he may, Mr. President, I'm happy to withdraw it if he's going to get to that I'm point. I'm listening to the answer. I have to admit, at this point, I'm in no way willing to rule it's not directly relevant 18 seconds in. I, I do consider the material he was talking about to be relevant, but I'll continue to listen. Senator Colbeck. One of the more preemptive points of order I've heard, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, so the, the Australian government, the Australian government is responsible Order. for the primarily responsible for funding and and regulation of the aged care sector, and part of that regulatory process is uh, a number of uh, standards for which aged care providers are responsible to meeting, and, and that includes management of infection control and, and a range of other other measures. There's 44 items in the standards that have to be complied with. Uh, and, and we regulate and assess all aged care providers across the, across the country to ensure that they do meet those standards. Order, and Senator of course, Colbert, we have processes to deal with them if they don't. Has expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. The egregious decision in 2011 by former Labor Minister for Agriculture, Joe Ludwig, to shut down our live cattle export industry overnight caused extreme hurt across the industry. It decimated the viability of productive and profitable businesses and destroyed communities and families, particularly across my Northern Territory and Queensland. Can the minister please provide an update to the Senate on the status of the Brett Cattle Company legal case? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator McMahon for her uh, question um, and recognising the, the long-standing interest that you've had in this particular industry well before your time in this place. Um, and as Senator McMahon rightly um, notes, the impact on live exporters of the decision by the former Labor government in 2010 to overnight ban live exports had a massive, massive impact on Australia, but it particularly had a massive impact on the families and the communities right across the nation um, who were directly involved in this industry. On the 22nd of July this year, the federal government has made the decision and announced the decision that it would not be appealing the federal court case, which ruled in favour of the Brett Cattle Company. Losses and damages will be appropriately determined by the court, because we believe that the prolonged pain hardship that has been caused to this industry has gone on long enough. Because on this side of the chamber, we believe that the industry deserves certainty, we believe it deserves our support going forward, and that certainty has been denied this industry for some time now. The livelihoods of producers were just basically cut off overnight. Um, and our focus from here on has to be on supporting our farmers, our exporters and the people that support that industry, um, who are an absolute integral part of the Australian economy and never more importantly than they are now, along with our resources sector as one of the key pillars to get Australia um, and to support Australia through the, the, the absolute pain and devastation of this current COVID crisis. $1.7 billion industry to, um, that supports our economy, over 10,000 jobs um, with industry and associated industry. We as a government are absolutely strongly committed to supporting and growing the value of agriculture, and that includes our live export industry. We have a very strong record of doing it, and we will continue to do it. Um, this was jeopardised. We're going to fix that problem now. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please outline the support the Liberals and Nationals government is providing to our cattle producers, particularly as they continue to manage through or recover from 
drought, floods and the impacts of COVID-19. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, and thank you, Senator McMahon. Um, this government is absolutely 100 per cent committed to supporting our farmers, and that includes our live cattle producers. Um, this government has committed over $10 billion across the country to support uh, drought response and recovery and preparedness actions following the 2019 floods, uh, and we also committed $3.3 billion in additional support measures. The National Drought and Northern Queensland Flood Response and Recovery Agency made available $300 million in grants to support restocking and replanting as well as rebuilding on-farm infrastructure that was damaged. This funding is helping all agriculture, but particularly our cattle producers, to get back on their feet because we know when they're back on their feet they do great things for the Australian economy. We understand there will be another drought, Senator McMahon, which is why we put in place the Permanent Drought Fund so that we can provide $100 million a year during drought years to make sure that we're prepared and we're resilient to the impacts of droughts when they inevitably occur in the future. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister please outline to the Senate the importance of the live animal export industry to Australia and our efforts to ensure extremely high standards of animal welfare. Senator Rustin. Much, Mr. President. Well, live exports in this country are underpinned by very strong regulation that supports good animal welfare outcomes. We have a framework in place which focuses continually on making sure that we improve and to make sure that the industry meets the community's expectations. There are standards for things like vessel preparation, uh, sourcing, loading, onboard management uh, of livestock, making sure that things like ventilation, drainage, stock densities and the provision of food and water to, to our animals on these vessels is absolutely first class. We always make sure that there's an accredited stock person on board the ship and, in many instances, there's a veterinarian as well. Um, the framework also includes processes to investigate when a situation does occur uh, and there is an incident. But we need to remember the overwhelming number of voyages that leave Australia with live animals on board are undertaken without any incident at all. Um, the government absolutely condemns, absolutely condemns cruelty to animals, and that's why Order, we put in place a world class. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Today, the Aged, Royal Care, the, the Aged Care Royal Commissioners, the Honourable Tony Pagone QC and Ms Linnell Briggs AO said, and I quote, had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the suffering of many people could have been avoided. How many of the 335 aged care recipients who have died from COVID-19 would be alive if the minister had acted upon previous reviews? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbert. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I wouldn't like to speculate on that as a, as a figure. Uh, one of the reasons that we called the Royal Commission, Mr President, is that um, successive governments, and I think this has been uh, also stated by uh, commissioners, the successive governments have, have uh, not acted as they perhaps could have done with respect to aged care. Uh, and, there is, and there is clearly work that needs Order. to be done, Mr. President. Order. And so I, 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 don't seek, I, don't, I don't seek to draw a correlation between those many reports that have been done into the aged care sector before I came to the portfolio. I don't seek to draw that correlation. I again offer my condolences to every single one of those to I, I offer my condolences to every single one of the families who have lost a loved one through COVID-19 to the Royal Commission uh, to, to COVID-19, uh, Mr. President. I, but I don't seek to draw that correlation. The Royal Commission has. I acknowledge that, uh, but I don't seek to do that. Uh, but I, what I do say, Mr. President, is that from the Order. outset of this pandemic, from the outset of this pandemic, this government, through firstly its public health response through the National Health COVID-19 Response Plan and its engagement with the aged care sector, have worked continuously to provide advice to the sector on how they can mitigate the entry of COVID-19 into aged care facilities, and also, if it does, there, does, does get into 
the sec into an aged care facility to protect the residents within, so within the facility and also the resources to do that. And we will continue to do that. We've learned a lot about this virus uh, over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, we will continue to learn because Order. there is still Senator more Colbeck, to learn. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Council assisting the Aged Care Royal Commission said that, and I quote, Neither the Commonwealth Department of Health nor the aged care regulator developed a COVID-19 plan specifically for the aged care sector. How many of the 335 aged care recipients who have died from COVID-19 would be alive if the minister had planned to protect them? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I reject the premise of the question. Uh, and I've, I've, I reject the premise of Senator Billick's question. Order. We have worked closely with the aged care Order, sector Senator Watt. as we've learnt more about this virus and we've continued to provide advice to the sector and the resources that they've required without limit, without Order. limit as, we've, as the pandemic has progressed. And we will continue to do that, Mr President. We will continue to do that. The aged PPC continues to provide advice. Uh, the, the CDNA continues to provide advice. And we have acted on the advice of the health professionals all the way through this pandemic and the resources that go with it, Mr. President, and the resources that go with it. Over $1 billion we've allocated to the aged care sector to support them and assist them to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, which is racking the world. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 300 and 35 aged care recipients have died from COVID-19. How many more aged care residents have to die before the Prime Minister accepts full responsibility for keeping them safe? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President. And every single one of those 385, 35, every one of those 335 deaths is an absolutely is an absolute tragedy. Every single one of those deaths is a, is a tragedy. Absolute tragedy. And again, my condolences to all of their families. We are dealing here, Mr. President, with a global pandemic, where we have, in this country, through our whole of government response, through the COVID-19 health pandemic plan, done exceptionally well. But of course. We haven't, nobody is immune from the virus. None of us are immune from the virus. And until we get, if we get a vaccine, then we will continue to be susceptible. Uh, and we will continue to do, as we have done all through the pandemic, everything that we possibly can to support this sector. Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator, order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Henderson. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is informing families at risk of violence about the support services that are available, especially during these difficult times resulting from COVID-19? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I thank Senator Henderson for her question and her ongoing interest uh, in um, making sure that we have the settings right to try and prevent domestic violence from happening before it even starts. Um, but the national campaign, Help Is Here, is a campaign that we launched in May this year. Uh, it's funded through the $150 million um, domestic violence uh, package that uh, was announced. Uh, this extra funding is absolutely directed in making sure that anybody who might be at risk of, uh, of domestic violence knows what support is available to them and where they're able to get those services. The Help Is Here campaign reaches Australians through a number of different ways. Uh, it's through the internet, in their homes, obviously on the television, but most importantly in places like shopping centres, uh, magazines and newspapers, where people who may actually be at greater risk are often by themselves. The main uh, two forms are through the 1800 Respect hotline and the dedicated men's line. The campaign uniquely uh, reflects the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic 
by recognising that during the pandemic some people at risk of domestic violence may not be able to leave their house apart from perhaps to go shopping. The Help Is Here campaign aims to reach uh, victims of domestic violence and abuse through the restrooms in shopping centres to make sure that they know where they can ring if they need to get some help if they are finding themselves in difficult times. By directing people to the national hotlines uh, and through the partnership networks that we have, we provide assistance 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so people can know that they can go online or onto the phone and speak to a trained counsellor um, from these particular initiatives that are being funded. I also want to thank the private sector for coming on board with this particular initiative um, with the campaign for Help Is Here, Channel 7, the major supermarket change as well as Amazon. And can I also acknowledge the work of the states and territories to which we've provided $130 million to support them in their frontline service provision. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Minister, what evidence is available to demonstrate the campaign is reaching Australians at risk of violence and providing them with the necessary support and information services? Senator Ruston. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I'm really pleased to say that the evaluation research results have shown that more than half Australians, when surveyed, had uh, recognised, remembered the campaign, and acknowledged that they had seen it. Uh, this is really important because increased awareness means that people will know automatically uh, where they can get the support should they find themselves in need of it. Um, as an example, in the middle of this year, uh, the 1800 Respect hotline uh, had received um, 86,000 contacts in the three-month period leading up to the 30th of July 2020. In the same time last year, they had received around 55,000 um, calls in the same period, a significant increase. The men's line also indicated that they had received an increase in calls. Um, we know uh, that more Australians know there is support out there, and that is a good thing, because we want them to know that they are not alone and the support services are there for them if they find themselves in a situation of needing them. And I would encourage anybody who finds themselves in a difficult situation to reach out to one of these two Order. hotlines for Senator support. Senator Ruston. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Oh, thank you, Mr President. Minister, it is good to hear Australians are reaching out for help. Can you please explain how the government is ensuring that vulnerable communities are getting the support they need as part of this campaign? Senator Ruston. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, well, this campaign has targeted everybody who is in Australia. We want to try and reach them by as many different means as possible, whether it be through the internet, through normal uh, channels like television and radio, in shopping centres, magazines, newspapers. Uh, because we want them to know that the national, um, two national hotlines are available to them. But most importantly, um, to make sure that people who uh, don't speak English as their first language, uh, and also making sure that we reach out to our Indigenous Australians to make sure that our advice is provided in an appropriate way. Um, so for our vulnerable communities, uh, the campaign materials have been tailored. Uh, for instance, in cold communities, we've translated our advertising materials into 14 different languages so that the audiences will be able to get access to the Help Is Here information. Uh, we've also worked with Indigenous mentors and Indigenous domestic violence survivors to prepare for distribution appropriate material uh, for news outlets uh, and specifically with the channels um, of distribution that they're most likely to use. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on a notice paper. Yeah. Senator Cormann. Thank you, um, Madam. Deputy President, I committed during question time to provide some information for Senator Keneally with respect to um, Epping Gardens, and I just do want to confirm that there are 126 facilities in Australia with an active case. They are all in Victoria. Um, Epping Gardens, uh, from the information that I've been given, had its first indication of an outbreak on the 19th of July. Um, uh, and, uh, these are DHHS figures, which actually count uh, contacts or um, that are not part of the facility, so they're not staff or residents. I indicated that I didn't think there were any with more than 100 resident out in, uh, residents in an outbreak. Epping Gardens, in fact, had 100 residents that were infected. It had 82 staff, uh, and uh, there are what DHS DHHS. Uh, classify as 29 other. Now, I don't know what the other means at this point in time. That's a DHHS um, classification which we are working 
through the Victorian Aged Care Recovery Centre to properly define. We believe it means family members and other contacts of, um, uh, of the infection at the facility. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions? Oh, you're not seeing the call. Okay. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Labor senators today. Well, nothing worked well from the outbreak. I thought we were prepared. Nothing prepared us for what was to come. I couldn't believe this was happening in my country. These are just some of the words from the Commonwealth's review into the new March House COVID-19 outbreak released today. That outbreak happened in April, some four months ago, and 19 older Australians died. Before that, there were warnings from overseas about the devastating impact of COVID in, in aged care. The alarm bells were ringing, Madam Deputy President, but the Morrison government was not listening. Today's report on New March House confirms that, as do the answers we heard from Senator Colbeck, that the aged care minister, Senator Colbeck, and the Morrison government did not have a plan in place to manage the COVID outbreaks in aged care in Australia. As we heard in question time today, 335 aged care recipients have passed away from COVID-19. There have been 1,761 COVID-19 cases in aged care. Each one of these numbers is a real person. It is somebody's mother or father. It is somebody's grandmother or grandfather. It is somebody's spouse, someone's life partner. These are some of Australia's most precious citizens. These are people who help build the nation who fought for it in several world wars, who worked and built communities, raised families, created jobs, were part of their church or their local service and organizations. And these older Australians are dying at home alone. They're dying in residential homes, aged care homes, alone. They are lucky if they get to hold the hand of a staff member in aged care. I mean, let's just imagine what kind of death we are talking about, because I sometimes think there is a perception that old people simply pass away. And perhaps that is a perception you could take from the lack of a response and a lack of a plan from the Morrison government. But old people don't just simply die. This is a highly contagious disease that attacks older Australians in residential aged care when there was not a plan in place to manage infection control, when there was not a plan in place to replace workforce when they got sick, when there was not a plan in place for protective equipment. And these older Australians who are vulnerable to this disease got sick and they're dying alone. And let's understand what kind of death that is. I heard one of the adult children of a woman who died in St. Basil's describe on, on radio that experience of having to watch his mother's death at a distance, of not being able to hold her hand or touch her. Can you imagine being in the last moments of your life and not being able to touch your children? Can you imagine watching your mother or father die just feet from you, maybe through a window, through a mask, and not being able to hug them in the last moments of their existence? Can you imagine your husband or your wife on their deathbed, and you can't even hold their hand in comfort. That's what kind of death this is. And we should not be surprised that our aged care homes were unable to cope with this, because if you look at the report handed down by the interim, the interim report handed down by the Royal Commission into Aged Care, that report is called neglect. It's not called compassionate care. It's not called preparedness. It's not called living with dignity in your old age. It is called neglect. Neglect. It talks about our senior citizens, our moms and dads, our grandparents and, grand and aunts and uncles in aged care homes with open sores and physical abuse and malnourishment, lack of infection control, whether we're talking about diarrhea or COVID-19. And I just want to pay tribute right here to the aged care frontline workers. I have met many of them. Many of them, 
They know. They're in my, I've met them and they're in tears, some of them, because they know they don't have the time or the resources or the support to give the care that they know that their residents need. And they're distressed too. They're on the front line of this outbreak too. The fact that we have a minister who hasn't engaged fully enough with this crisis in aged care, from the handing down of a report called neglect, through to last Friday when he didn't know the answers to basic questions, through to question time today. We need a plan and we need it today. We needed it yesterday, we need it tomorrow, we need it right now to look after our senior citizens in aged care. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. No one could help but be moved to think about how difficult it must be to be someone facing the end of their lives, unable to be with their families, unable to have the comfort and support of the people with whom they have travelled the journey of life. I can speak from experience. Um, early on during the aged care um, impacts of COVID-19, I lost my grandfather. And it was very difficult not to be able to be with him in the last moments of his life. He's a man I loved. He immigrated to this country from Austria. He built a life here. He came with very few skills. He was a um, person who worked in the textile factories at the time he emigrated and by the time um, he finished his career he was a foreman at Kimberley Clark making the nappies that I suspect my children wore <laughs> um, for the many years of them being small. And he was a thoroughly good man. But he died alone. None of the criticisms that are being levelled by those opposite are, in a logical sense, truly connected to my experience of loss or the experience of loss that many other Australians have undergone in recent times, as we have all, as a nation, had to adapt to the difficulty of the restrictions that come with COVID-19. It's hard even now for people with a loved one in aged care not to be able to give them the usual support and care that they ordinarily uh, would give with love as an expression of gratitude for the many gifts that that older person has given throughout the course of their life. It remains difficult, but it's also reflective of the collective sacrifices that Australians from all walks of life are making as we attempt to get under control a virus that is ravaging the world. It's ravaging people's health. It's ravaging our economy. And it's having knock-on consequences for communities everywhere. And so to acknowledge the hardship that comes from this difficult time is a very different thing to trying to pretend that this is all about the minister's um, role. The minister has stepped up enormously during a difficult time. There have been fast adaptations of a big industry to hardships that have been quite unprecedented. And those opposite who like to interject, um, you know, they like to make out they're a little bit holier than they are on the stuff. But this isn't just me talking. This isn't me. I, look, I take that interjection because. We, we can't allow these kinds of misinformations to stand. Deputy Chief Medical Officer Dr Nick Coatesworth is on the record with this. He says, allegations that the government lacked urgency when helping aged care homes to battle coronavirus are insulting. Insulting, that's what you're doing. You're insulting the aged care workers who have tried so hard to adapt to the challenge of this time. And similarly, he has said, the first thing to say is that there were many words used in the Royal Commission witness statements that he was referring to there that don't reflect the totality of the government's response, both at federal and state level, to pre preventing deaths in aged care. And here's, here's the guts of it. 
This is a virus that disproportionately affects the aged in our community. That's not a statement of futility. That's a statement of fact. Now, that's a direct quote from him. You can, you can cast arrows at me all you like, but that is a statement of fact from a man of science who understands how viruses like this work. It's very easy to throw political arrows over this side and try and claim a scalp or two or try and string up a minister to blame, but ultimately this is the nature of the virus and we are doing everything that can possibly be done to get it under control so that people in our community, people like my family, don't have to experience the death of a loved Thank one Thank you, alone. Senator Stoker. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Thank you, Deputy President. Four failed ministers in a third-term Liberal government. First appointment was the former Senator Mitch Fifield, had no interest at all in aged care. Then we had uh, Susan Lay, the current uh, minister who's back in the ministry, had no interest in aged care. Then we had Minister Ken Wright, who had no capacity to deliver anything in terms of reform of the aged care sector. And now we have Senator Colbeck. Well, what an embarrassment for this government. Aged care was always going to be in trouble when this virus hit this country. There is nothing new there because this government has not had a minister that was interested enough to make sure there were plans in place. This didn't suddenly hit Australia before anywhere else. This pandemic was known. And we already knew because we'd had 14 reports into the aged care sector during the terms of this government telling us each and every one of them the problems that we had through lack of resource, lack of training, lack of staff, lack of money. This Prime Minister when he was treasurer, ripped a billion dollars out of the aged care sector. He used the aged care sector as an ATM machine. No wonder the sector couldn't cope when the COVID-19 hit. Now, there's fantastic staff and good providers in this sector, and I take my hat off to them each and every day when they're doing the best that they can. But for the Prime Minister to make a commitment after the last election that he was going to make aged care a priority, he is accountable and he must be held responsible for the issues and the crisis in the aged care sector now. But we know the Prime Minister. He doesn't want any accountability. He certainly doesn't want any transparency. And he's standing by his man. Well, this minister has failed older Australians miserably. Even today, in the chamber, he still couldn't get the figure right. He still couldn't get the figure correct. 385 older Australians, he said, died. The figure is 335. Now, he's a minister under pressure. We do understand that. We do. But older Australians and their family deserve so much more so much more. We knew that this COVID-19, when it hit our shores, of course older Australians, we know they're some of the most vulnerable in the community to be susceptible to this virus. But when a, a sector such as the aged care sector was already in crisis, this is a government who called a royal commission into its own failings. They already knew that the sector was in crisis and they did nothing about it. So to have a minister, a junior minister, being responsible for the aged care sector is unacceptable. When we were in last in government, and bearing in mind this is the third term of this government, we held aged care in the priority that it should be by having a cabinet minister. We have been calling on each and every Liberal government since then to elevate aged care into the Cabinet, but they have failed to do that. What they have done is used it as a cash cow and ripped a billion dollars out by the Prime Minister when he held the portfolio of Treasury. We know they've been underfunding it. We know that there's been in excess of 14 reports 
since they've come to government, and each and every one of those has given us the warnings. There's red lights going flashing all the time. Not enough staff, not enough resources, money being ripped out. It needs to be regulated. We need to have national training. We need to ensure that there's uniformity across this country. Now, we have been told time and time again. Now, they must have realised there were some issues when they called the Royal Commission. We've had the interim report, and what have we seen? No real action from this government. What they want to do is use that Royal Commission as an excuse. Well, the Australian people are not going to accept it. One of the good things about calling this Royal Commission was they got the media interested and the Australian people are interested. Now is the time for the Prime Minister Thank to step you, up Senator and Polly. to Your act. Time has expired. Senator Carr. I beg your pardon, Senator Scar. <laughs> it's a big difference, Madam Deputy President. Absolutely. We're both nice guys but different philosophy. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, I know one of those 335 who have passed away in our residential aged care facilities. Uh, my great auntie Edie uh, passed away in New South Wales. She did not deserve to go the way she did. But she did, like another 334, and my thoughts and prayers are with every single family who has lost someone in these circumstances, whether or not in an aged care facility or otherwise. I would first like to compliment the minister on facing the dogged questioning from the opposition over the course of question time. Every single question was put to the minister during the course of question time, and he faithfully gave answers to each and every question. And he started his answer to the first question by noting his deep regret that last Friday he was not able to provide the figures which had been asked for. And I have no doubt, knowing the minister as I know him, that that apology was heartfelt, it was sincere, it was genuine and it was given with great dignity. Those listening to this debate would be excused for thinking that all of the responsibility with respect to aged care falls at the minister's feet. The answer is very, very different. I refer to the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 outbreaks in residential care facilities national guidelines which were adopted under the auspices of the Communicable Diseases Network Australia. And that document sets out the actual responsibilities for each of the stakeholders in aged care. And I just want to give a summary of those responsibilities, because if you were listening to this debate, you would think the sole person responsible was Minister Colbeck, and that is simply untrue. First, residential care facilities, and I quote from the guidelines, the primary responsibility of managing COVID-19 outbreaks lies with the residential care facilities in their responsibility for resident care and infection control. All residential care facilities should have access to infection control expertise, whether in-house or not, and outbreak management plans in place. And I'll repeat those words. The primary responsibility of managing COVID-19 outbreaks lies with the residential care facilities. And these are guidelines. These are guidelines that were accepted by the entire industry. These are the industry's guidelines. The primary responsibility lies with the residential care facilities. Then next, state, territory, departments of health. State, territory, public health sections in departments of health will act in an advisory role to assist residential care facilities to detect, characterise and manage COVID-19 outbreaks. This includes assisting facilities to confirm outbreaks, providing advice and obtaining testing samples, providing guidance on outbreak management, monitoring the severity of illness and so it goes on. So those are responsibilities of the state, territory, departments of health. And I'll come to the Australian Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Its responsibility is as the national regulator of aged care services. And then the Australian Government Department of Health for residential aged care facilities that receive funding from the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth will work collaboratively with the overall management of the response to support the viability and capacity of the 
residential care facilities to access services. And the Commonwealth Government, under the, under the leadership of the, of the minister, minister Colbeck, has been doing exactly that. It has provided an additional $1 billion in funding. Just as recently as last Friday, it provided over an additional $171 million. Those are the roles and responsibilities of each of the players, the stakeholders in the aged care facility. And that was aged care facilities. That was the uh, observation also in the independent review that was released today, the final report dated 20 August 2020, into the new March House COVID-19 outbreak. And that responsibility of the residential care facilities was front and centre in that report. Appendix 1 contained a summary of key learnings, 1 through to 20, 20 key learnings, covering a diverse range of subjects. It is simply disingenuous. It is quite reprehensible in some respects in the circumstances to try and apportion all the blame onto Minister Colbeck. Thank you, Senator Scar. Your time has expired. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This government has left vulnerable older Australians at risk and exposed to a deadly virus. But first, because we are talking about real people here, not numbers in daily reports, let me acknowledge the sad news that we are hearing out of Victoria about the significant number of deaths in aged care facilities. Our thoughts must be with every single person who has lost a loved one during this pandemic, and particularly, particularly those families who have loved ones in aged care facilities, some who are deeply worried and not getting news in a timely manner the way that they should. And we know that it's been an incredibly difficult few weeks for some of those families and their loved ones in some of these aged care facilities, particularly in Victoria. These are some of the most vulnerable Australians and they deserve a government with a plan to keep them safe. We know that the warning bells were ringing in March but nobody in the government was listening. We know that 335 residents have passed away and there are more than 1,300 active cases. And yet the Minister and the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, continue, and we heard it again just a moment ago in the contribution from the Senator opposite, continue to pass the buck and the blame. It has been a disgraceful exercise to witness. The Morrison government is in charge of aged care. The Morrison government regulates aged care. It funds aged care. The Morrison government has the legislation that determines the quality of aged care that older Australians get. If things are not working, if systems are not working, the Morrison government is ultimately responsible for this. The buck stops with Scott Morrison and with this minister. This man who does not seem to have any kind of real grasp on what his job actually is. We saw just last Friday that Minister Colbeck couldn't even answer basic questions when questioned by the Select Committee on COVID-19 inquiry into the Australian government's response to the pandemic. The Australian public was genuinely stunned that he was not across the most basic and tragic facts. And his performance in this place today has done nothing, absolutely nothing, to give Australians confidence that he knows what his job is, that he has the capacity to lead, to assert the right that these Australians have to quality care, to protection from infection from a deadly pandemic, to communicate with their families and loved ones, to be cared for by a workforce that is adequately trained, has secure work, is adequately pays and goes to work each day in conditions that are safe. It's time for Scott Morrison and his Minister for Aged Care to be honest. They knew aged care facilities would struggle to find staff during a coronavirus outbreak, but they did nothing. They knew about the potential for a withdrawal of uh, staff at an aged care home because of coronavirus, but they did not do enough to prepare for this. Scott Morrison said on the 29th of July the events that have tragically occurred in Victorian aged care homes could not have been anticipated or foreshadowed, but his government was repeatedly warned that it could happen. It happened at Earlhaven over a year ago. 
It happened at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and New March House months ago. And we stand in this chamber today with still no answer to the question. Why did Scott Morrison and his um, minister Urquhart, not have a— Senator Urquhart, I do remind you to refer to those in the other place by their correct Apologies. Title. Why did the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and this minister not have a proper plan to deal with the loss of workforce in aged care homes? It is also tragically clear that the Morrison government's surge workforce has been inadequate to deal with outbreaks of coronavirus. We also found out that the Morrison government has spent just half, just half of the money that it set aside for a surge workforce meant to assist aged care homes impacted by coronavirus. This is completely unacceptable. The minister says we're still learning and we're in discussions. He seems utterly incapable of the leadership required to acknowledge the damage this government has wrought in our aged care sector and how a pandemic has served to reveal and deepen and shatter the structural cracks that we're already undermining it. Yet Mr Morrison says he had some full confidence in this incompetent Thank you, minister. Senator Urquhart. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers from Senator Colbeck be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers to my questions of Senator Colbeck um, on aged care. And we had the minister talking as if just because other countries had had outbreaks of COVID in residential aged care that maybe, we, maybe it was inevitable that it would happen here. Well, it wasn't, and it shouldn't have been inevitable that it happened here if we had a system that was set up to actually function properly. The fact is, is that we have had 35 reports over the last 40 years, nearly a report a year, into the failures in aged care and how it should be fixed. And the fact is, despite the minister saying all the other countries are worse, the fact is, according to the Royal Commission into Aged Care, the very Royal Commission that this government called, Australia has one of the highest rates in the world of residential aged care deaths as a proportion of deaths from COVID-19. That is quite shocking. That is quite shocking to the families that have lost loved ones in residential aged care during this pandemic. For years, and years. People that know what they're talking about have been calling for reform in aged care and, in particular, significant investment of resources. So today we saw that Professor Polaris has called and said that we need an investment of at least $3.5 billion into residential aged care. And what do we hear from the minister in answer to my questions? Was we've got to wait for the Royal Commission? Well, the fact is that these things are happening right now. We have insufficient workforce right now. We have insufficient practices right now. We are not seeing clinical care addressed. Just last year, I tabled in this, uh, in this place the uh, Community Affairs Committee report into aged care and, clinic, and in particular the focus on clinical care and highlighted the problems with clinical care being provided in to residential aged care facilities. And I maintain that if we'd started addressing those clinical care issues, that that's one of the things that we should have been addressing, uh, we, or we wouldn't need to address so much now, because we would have those things in place and could have dealt with the infectious disease control. We are still not providing, and, and we still have seen that all workers in residential aged care have not completed the most up-to-date infectious disease control. How can this be happening in this country? How can this be happening? Why haven't we been investing the money in our workforce that so many reports have so clearly shown that we need? We need to significantly invest in our aged care workforce so that we're providing the level of care four hours, 18 minutes, that is recommended that we provide. Why aren't we doing urgently across this country so that we don't see the tragedy that has been unfolding in Victoria happen anywhere else 
that, heaven forbid, there should be an outbreak of COVID somewhere else. Unless we are making sure that every residential aged care facility has actually been audited. We cannot, we cannot assure the Australian public that people living in residential aged care are safe. What did our regulator of aged care do? The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. They sent out a form for self-assessment by these residences. And now people out there may be shocked to learn that most of those residential facilities said, yes, we're prepared. Those in Victoria said, yes, we are prepared. And yet look at the tragedy that we are seeing unfold in Victoria. It shows very clearly that we need a much heavier handed heavy handed approach in I hate to say but we do in the regulation of aged care in this country we need to beef up our aged care safety and quality commission at the moment they've only had an additional 13 staff that is nowhere near enough to deal with the issues that we need to be dealing with this country expected that our residential aged care facilities would keep people's loved ones safe would keep our older Australians safe, and it has, failed, it has failed enormously. What we are seeing in Victoria could roll out anywhere else in the country unless we actually step up our workforce in all residential aged care facilities. We make sure all our, our workers are supported, that they don't have to go begging for additional support. These things are urgent. They can't wait to the Royal Commission report. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers by Minister Colbeck be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.